I'm finally at the airport, flying from Washington, D.C. through San Francisco to Seoul, South Korea, one step closer to getting back to China. I'm Sophia Yan, the Telegraph's China correspondent, and I'm trying to get back to my home in Beijing. I picked up my new visa yesterday. Uh, it's always very difficult to get journalist visas into China. And the reason I had to get another one is because my original flight back was canceled. I've been living and working in China for the last decade, and I know nothing is quite as it seems at first glance. Beijing said my original flight was canceled because of COVID, but I suspect it was in retaliation for a senior U.S. politician visiting Taiwan, an island China claims as its own. And so it's been a couple of weeks of uncertainty and trying to figure out what next, um, but I've gotten this far, so I'm on a flight into China for real on Monday in a couple of days' time, but only after I do more COVID testing once I get to Seoul. But first, a coffee. Right now, the whole world is watching China. This week is the 20th Party Congress, a twice-in-a-decade political set piece that reveals the outcome of China's very secretive leadership selection. And there is, of course, only one man in the running. Xi Jinping. This is seismic. After the death of Chairman Mao Zedong, there has been a two-term limit on Chinese leaders. No more. Xi is on the cusp of effectively becoming ruler for life. He has changed China enormously, and he's set on changing the world, too. Understanding him has never been more important. I've spent the last few months traveling around the world for this podcast. Now I'm trying to get back to Beijing to finish my reporting. So far, it hasn't been easy. I'm one of a handful of foreign correspondents still based in China, and I've been everywhere from Wuhan to Xinjiang. I know what I'm up against. But as you're going to hear later in this podcast, reporting on Xi might be my toughest assignment yet. There's eight to 12 men and women following me. There's a whole bunch of them that are taking videos and photos of me. And they are in plain clothes, but some of them have taken their jackets off. And on the inside, the lining of the jacket, it actually says police. Even after 10 years in power, she remains a puzzle, one we know very little about beyond official propaganda. In that time, he's never given a proper interview to foreign media. And journalists like me are always very tightly controlled. We've come into a bathroom now to try to upload all these files in case on my way out I get stopped and searched and they try to delete these. This is what reporting in China is like. <laughs> it's incredible. He has many names. Uncle Xi, chairman of everything, China's CEO, Mao 2.0. But who is he, really? How did he become the most powerful man in the world? And what does that mean for all of us? China under Xi doesn't like these sorts of questions, but I'm going to try and ask them anyway. Don't touch don't... me! Wish me luck. This is How to Become a Dictator with me, Sophia Yan. Step one. Live in a cave. To understand how Xi Jinping became the man he is today, you have to go back to one of the darkest periods of the 20th century, China's Cultural Revolution. It began in 1966 when Mao called for ordinary Chinese citizens to go out and purge the country of anyone deemed an ideological enemy or traitor of the state. We'll explore Mao further in episode three. For now, all you need to know is that he plunged the country into violence, chaos, and famine. Hundreds of thousands, possibly millions, died as a result. When the Cultural Revolution began, Xi was 13 years old, a shy, soft-spoken teenager who had led a sheltered, cushy life in Beijing. Born into red royalty, he was the son of Xi Zhongxun, a revolutionary hero who fought alongside Mao to put the party in power in 1949. The elder Xi rose to become vice premier. Xi's generation, known as princelings, were afforded privileges few others had. 
This is from a leaked U.S. diplomatic cable based on intel given by an anonymous fellow princeling nicknamed The Professor. The most permanent influences shaping Xi's worldview were his princeling pedigree and formative years growing up with families of first-generation CCP revolutionaries in Beijing's exclusive residential compounds. The professor was Xi's neighbor and a friend of the family. We'll be coming back to this cable throughout the series because it's a rare insight into what the intelligence community knew of Xi back in 2009. After years of conversations with Xi and having shared a common upbringing with him, our contact is convinced that she has a genuine sense of entitlement, believing that members of his generation are the legitimate heirs to the revolutionary achievements of their parents and therefore deserve to rule China. But sitting high up means the fall can be brutal. Mao had turned on Xi's father a few years earlier, making the family especially vulnerable. His father was beaten and thrown in solitary confinement. Xi himself was publicly denounced in front of crowds. Even his mother was forced to join in and shout down with Xi Jinping. Suicide is most probably what became of his elder half-sister. Official accounts say she was persecuted to death. Uh, Wei Jingsheng knew the Xi family personally and remembers it being a tough time for the kids. Xi Jinping was friends with my younger brother when we were all young. Both of them were often bullied at school. At the time, Xi was a naive little boy. He seemed like everybody else. He didn't stand out much. I think his father being criticized and persecuted within the party had a huge impact on his mentality growing up. Even when he was young, she had a darker side. He wasn't really the sunniest person. This was the first truly formative experience of Xi's life being the son of a blacklisted official. The second came at 16 when he was exiled to the countryside, one of the many urban youths sent by Mao to be re-educated in rural areas. He lived in a cave and spent his days doing manual labor. At first he found it so hard that he fled back to Beijing, but he was forced to return and eventually settled into the peasant lifestyle. This is how she tells the story of those years. In the late 1960s, when I was a teenager, I went from Beijing to Yang'an, Shanxi, a small village called Lianjiahe, where I became a farmer and spent seven years there. The villagers and I all lived in caves and slept on a tu kang, a heatable earth bed. The villagers lived a very poor life and often didn't eat any meat for months. I cut grass with them when it was rainy and windy. I watched the animals at night and I went with them to herd the sheep. I did everything. One time, I carried 100 kilograms of wheat along three miles of mountain road without even switching shoulders. There's more than a little bragging in the way she talks about this time. Not all of it is believable. Another story tells of how he loved reading so much that he would stay up all night devouring books by candlelight while the other workers slept. He says he even once walked nearly 10 miles just to get a copy of Faust from a neighboring village. Hmm. But it wasn't always easy. He slept with fleas and got his hands dirty. He even talked about getting splashed with poo while digging a storage pit to build a heat stove. Being the son of a blacklisted official meant he couldn't get a better placement, like with the military. But because his father was once a revolutionary hero, he had some perks. Getting cornflower rations while others received only husks. 
the way she talks about it, those cave years were rough, but wholesome. A learning experience, like doing the Duke of Edinburgh Award or Tough Mudder. But Jing Sheng, who also went to the countryside during this time, paints a very different picture of those years. When I was sent down to the countryside, I watched many people starve to death. The village next to us was empty because they all died of hunger. Cannibalism was not uncommon. There was no other choice. People ate mice, cats, dogs, until those two were gone. We really had nothing to eat. People would die while waiting for the rice paddies to become fertile. These horrific conditions made me think that the Communist Party, particularly under Mao Zedong, really was a huge mistake and would only bring us suffering. It wasn't just my hometown that faced such situations. It was the entire country. History has rarely seen a tragedy of this scale. I didn't expect that I would survive. That I did was pure luck. At the end of the Cultural Revolution, Xi, by now in his early 20s, returned to Beijing a changed person. Out in the caves, he really did shi kuo, as the Chinese say. It literally translates to eat bitterness. But what it really signifies is his ability to endure hardship, a valued trait. Over the years, she would make this the centerpiece of his story, his founding myth as a leader. He would refer to it over and over again in speeches and essays. The northern plateau of Shaanxi province are my roots as a servant of the state. Whatever difficulties I would encounter in the future, I am fully charged with the courage to take on any challenge. Many of the fundamental ideas and qualities I have today were formed in Yang'an. Okay, so that's the official version of his early life. But not much else is known. His official biography, polished by censors, is sparse on details. His first wife, never mentioned. It's not even clear exactly how many siblings he has. What we do know is that the Cultural Revolution was a tumultuous time to come of age, and it influenced Xi enormously, although in a different way than you might expect. That U.S. cable, quoting the professor, described him as an ambitious survivor. While the professor and his closest circle of friends descended into the pursuit of romantic relationships, drink, movies, and Western literature as a release from the hardships of the time, Xi Jinping, by contrast, chose to survive by becoming redder than red. The professor said his former friend was mediocre, but extremely driven. Xi Jinping could not talk about women and movies and did not drink or do drugs. She was considered of only average intelligence. Women thought she was boring. Nevertheless, despite Xi's lack of popularity in the conventional sense, she was not cold-hearted he was still considered a good guy, generous and loyal. He is exceptionally ambitious, confident and focused, and has had his eye on the prize from early adulthood. And he went in a different direction to many of his contemporaries. Wei Jingsheng became a staunch democracy activist, was imprisoned in China for 18 years and exiled to the US, but not she. <laughs> She was persecuted, and his family was persecuted. In the end, he used the same tactics on others that Mao used to persecute him. You could say he's the biggest victim of Stockholm Syndrome. Maybe it's because he and his family suffered so much that he chose to follow the same path, to make others suffer too. But all that is still a long way off in the 1970s. First, he has to get into the Communist Party. Much easier said than done for the son of a purged senior official. More on that after the break. Hi, Venetia Rainey here. I'm the producer of How to Become a Dictator, which means I've spent months working with Sophia to delve into Xi Jinping's past and how it might affect China's future. 
My job is to make sure that her reporting on China makes it out of the country and into the Telegraph. But it's dangerous and expensive. And that's where our subscribers come in. Without their contribution, we can't make shows like this one. So if you'd like to support what we're doing and to get unlimited access to a huge range of journalism on foreign affairs, politics, sport, business and more, go to telegraph.co.uk slash dictator, where you can get 30 days free access to The Telegraph. After that, it's just £2 a week. That's telegraph.co.uk slash dictator, or click on the link in the episode description. The first time Xi Jinping applied to join the Chinese Communist Party, he was rejected. But he was too ambitious to let that stop him. Most people know that one person who kept failing their driving test. That's Xi trying to get into politics. So he applied again. And again. And again. And again. On the 10th try, he was finally accepted. It's 1974, and his ascent up through the party has officially begun. Two years later, Mao dies, easing the stigma around Xi's family name. By 1979, Xi is an officer in the People's Liberation Army and secretary to the Minister of National Defense. He wears his uniform every day. Next up, marriage. He ties the knot with Ke Lingling, the daughter of China's ambassador to the UK at the time. But when Lingling wants to return to England, the pair divorce. She shrugs it off. He has more important things to worry about. 1983. He lands a party chief title in charge of a small rural county in northern China. She tells the professor at the time that going to the provinces is his only path to central power, according to the leaked cable. 1985, he gets bumped up again. Now he's executive vice mayor of a smallish city in eastern Fujian province, a coastal area facing Taiwan. Fujian is another formative experience for Xi. This is where he spends the next 17 years and where he'll sharpen his views on how China should conquer Taiwan. <laughs> Fujian is also when Xi meets his second wife, Peng Liyuan, a glamorous celebrity soprano. They marry in 1987, and some wonder why she picks him, a nobody at this point. In a television interview, the host says it must be emasculating for him to be known as the husband of Peng Liyuan. She laughs it off, says that they're a good match, she'd never think of marrying beneath her, and that he's successful in many other ways. But we can speculate about why he picks her. Li Yuan is a household name, someone who gives him a certain star power. She's also a true patriot and even holds a rank equivalent to Major General. When the Tiananmen Square massacre happens in 1989, Li Yuan is sent to perform to lift the spirits of the soldiers involved in the crackdown. Within a few years, they have a daughter together, Xi Mingzi. So family life is good. But politically, he's not making much of an impression. He's such a lightweight that in 1997, when the party runs something of an election for its central committee, she comes in last. He was kind of a competent but not outstanding cadre. So if you like, it was a model of the success of mediocrity. Steve Tsang is a political scientist and historian who specializes in China at SOAS, University of London. But what he also did that other mediocre cadres of the Communist Party were not able to do was to take advantage of his family background and the very high regard his father was being held by many cadres within the party, which enabled him to rise quite quickly in the hierarchy and move from the local to the central level of leadership successfully. 
By 2000, he's put in charge of entire provinces. And she starts writing a regular column for state media. He used a pen name, Zhexing. If we stay removed from ordinary people, we will be like a tree cut off from its roots. Officials at all levels should change their working style, put down the haughty manner, and set a good example it's where we start to see hints of his manifesto. Quite an insight because he wrote more than 200 installments over four years. We must promote clean government by examining corruption-prone sectors, major developments. Officials should not be misled into focusing exclusively on governance by ballot. The moral deprivation of officials often begins with unchecked behavior and stems from seemingly trivial activities, such as whining and dining and socializing. Looking back, the focus on anti-corruption and being in touch with the masses looks like a clear pitch for the top job. I think Xi Jinping was very focused. He was very focused on getting to the top. Steve saying again. And once he can get to the top, he will do what he intended to do. But until then, he was not prepared to take risk, which could potentially draw attentions to him and could therefore potentially derail his rise through the hierarchy all the way up to the very top. In 2007, after more than 30 years of climbing the party ladder, she looks set to get his wish. He makes a power grab to become party secretary of Shanghai, China's biggest city. It pays off. Six months later... Xi Jinping... At the party congress, he becomes the top billed politician in China's new standing committee. Just a handful of men who are the country's most powerful. It's a big deal. It means he's designated as China's next leader. The party congress of the Communist Party are very heavily planned and choreographed. So the fact that he was being allowed to go in a particular order in coming out indicates basically what has been agreed. So it did show that he was somebody who was going to be annoyed as the next general secretary. At the time, I confess that I was not particularly concerned about Xi Jinping because up to that point, there really wasn't that much of Xi Jinping's record to suggest that he would be a dramatically different figure. Xi is now vice president of China. It's the final step on his climb to power, and he's immediately given his first major task. The 2008 Summer Olympic Games are China's big coming out on the world stage. A chance to cement its place as a rising global superpower. He pulls out all the stops for the perfect show. Before the games, there are calls to boycott over human rights abuses. Athletes fret about how the country's thick smog will impact their performance. Pro-Tibetan protesters crop up along the Olympic torch relay. All this embarrassing for China. The answer? Plunge Tibet into an internet blackout. Lock up dissidents. Suppress journalists. It almost goes off without a hitch. Almost. An adorable little girl is due to sing an ode to the motherland at the opening ceremony. She has the voice of an angel, but a mouth full of crooked teeth. The solution? Yet young Pei was judged to be not cute enough to take the stage, so they arranged a lip sync. Everything has to be perfect. He even has clouds seeded to avoid any chance of the weather literally raining on his parade. The control, the obsession with appearances, an early glimmer of what later becomes the norm under Xi. (laughs) 
it's also a test by the party. She passes with flying colors, and he starts to become more confident to let his guard down just a touch about what he truly thought of the world and China's place in it. This is from a 2009 speech in Mexico. There are some bored foreigners with full stomachs who have nothing better to do than point fingers at us. First, China doesn't export revolution. Second, China doesn't export hunger and poverty. Third, China doesn't come and cause you headaches. What more is there to be said? Some diplomats are shocked. His view is clear. China was superior and its time to shine had come, with him at the helm. There's only one obstacle left, a rival contender. Between U.S. and China. We are a good partner uh, talking about uh, economic cooperation. In Tall, future. striking, charismatic. Vo Xilai, also a princeling. But in 2012, Vo gets caught up in one of China's most dramatic scandals ever, made for tabloids. Corruption, murder, and intrigue. Flamboyant. He's not only taking millions in bribes, but of his spectacular downfall exposes the messy infighting in the the following year, the, powerful politician was sentenced to life in prison for the timing is perfect. Well, I want to welcome uh, Vice President Xi uh, to the Oval Office. As Bull falls, Xi embarks on a whistle-stop world tour. Amid all the usual dinners and meetings, he makes one surprising stop to a place close to his heart, somewhere he had visited as a young official back in the 1980s. Somewhere he hoped would show China and the world that he was a man of the people, much the same way his caviars did. All right. About to leave Des Moines now. Um, and I'm heading over to the Kimberly farm. In 600 feet. In 2012, when Xi Jinping came to Iowa, he stopped at this particular farm. He met the Kimberleys. Maybe it seems bizarre to drive out to a farm in rural Iowa for a podcast about China's leader. But it's hard to overstate how unusual this visit was. No one gets near Xi. I couldn't pass up the opportunity. Hi, Rick. Hi. I'm Sophia. Uh, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Just That's owner Rick Kimberly. On and for one day in February 2012, his life turned upside down. Right here is where we uh, greeted uh, President Xi, Vice President Xi at the time. Was right. It was a whole avalanche. People were following us. You know, there's a lot of security. Roads were blocked off and whatnot so they could come out. So it was... Uh, just really interesting. We had these gates open here. Rick and his son Grant gave Xi a tour. And as we got closer to the house, uh, my wife was up on our deck and we had the exchanges there. President Xi was very nice. He always had a large smile on his face and made us feel like we were old friends, in fact. And so we proceeded to go on into the house. And that's one thing most people that President Xi's been to a lot of places all over the world but probably not too many places that he's been in people's homes and so we really feel that's quite an honor and they sat and on the living room couch together and like, talked about you know, corn soybeans and life as a farmer so it was just a very special time something you'll never forget <laughs> But there was one thing in particular that caught the Chinese vice president's eye we were walking across the yard, and uh, I saw him looking at this tractor, and so uh, I just asked him, I said, would you like to get in the tractor? And uh, he didn't wait for the interpreter, mm -hmm. he, he understood, and he went right for the tractor. Yeah, he wanted to get in the tractor. I couldn't resist. I really wanted to drive that tractor. Well, I'll switch seats with you. Okay. I've never driven a tractor. I wonder if she had driven one before. I doubt it. Okay. 
Okay, so we'll bring, yeah, go ahead and turn. So this is the clutch. Oh, it's very sensitive. Oh, there we go. <laughs> so how far did uh, she drive in this one? Not as much as you did. <laughs> did so, he say anything to you while he was inside the tractor? Well, yeah, we talked, but you know, pretty much just how fast can it go? <laughs> right, right. Yep, just turn it off. Seriously, the closest I'm ever getting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, that was fun. As we flicked through photos together, I wondered how much of the real she anybody got to see. Tell you what, though, this picture here says it all right here. Mm -hmm. look, look in the face. Yeah. Look at the Can you really get close to someone like him? It's not fake. It's not phony. It was truly an enjoyable time. The visit was more about signaling to Chinese people back home than anything else. And it worked. A decade later, and Chinese tourists still drive right up to Kimberly Farm, snapping pictures of the place. That summer of 2012, after she returns from Iowa, the path to power seems clear. At 59, he's a leader from a new generation, the first to be born after the Communist Party founded the People's Republic of China. Early chatters upbeat about the change he might bring. Then, as he is poised to become number one, he disappears. So where is the next president of China? In his absence, rumors swirl about what's going on. Signals. Reports range from an exercising injury, a car accident, perhaps something more political, that the Chinese Communist Party no longer supports him. Diplomats well, say they've been told the 59-year-old injured his back while swimming or in a soccer game. Today that those rumors seem improbable. He thinks his mysterious absence is yet another sign of the instability in China. Then, just as suddenly, he reappears. <laughs> As if nothing happened, the Communist Party gathers as planned. And at the end of that meeting, in November 2012, he's made leader of China. Even 10 years on, no one has ever uncovered the truth. That's how much of a black box Chinese politics is. Steve Sang explains. Well, we didn't really know what happened, and we still don't know what happened in reality. But with the benefit of hindsight, it is clearer that he really disappeared as a political act in a way to try to make sure that he could get his way. And he clearly used that disappearance as a way to impose a kind of conditions to the party leadership which will enable him to move very quickly after he became leader. And this is where I think he genuinely was able to outsmart his colleagues in the party. It's a telling start to his reign, a sign that she was not to be underestimated. You're going to hear lots more about that in the rest of this podcast. But first, I need to get into China. I've made it safely to Seoul, jumped through all the COVID hoops, and been allowed onto a flight to Qingdao, a coastal city. But as soon as I land, there's a problem. We're being made to line up about a meter apart. Uh, they've got to check a whole bunch of forms, it looks like. A lot of hazmat suits. Let me see. I'm sorry. It's wrong. From here, follow me. This isn't it? Yes. Wrong. Being told that there's some sort of issue with whatever code that I had registered for before entering this approval to enter. So with COVID, um, I'm not really sure what's going on. Yeah, no, I was lined up here, but she said this was not the right code. Oh, uh, you, you need to correct it. Correct it. But how? How do I correct it? What is wrong with you? They look just like that picture. It looks like getting home is going to be harder than I thought. You've been listening to How to Become a Dictator with me, Sophia Yan, China correspondent for The Telegraph. Reporting by me, with additional research by Jenny Pan. The producers are Venetia Rainey and Yulene Goffin. 
Sound design is by Giles Gear with original music by Elliot Lampett. The executive producer is Louisa Wells and the commissioning editor is Louis Emanuel. Follow this feed on your podcast app to make sure you don't miss an episode.